Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today we'll be interviewing Dr. Philip Curry, who is interestingly one of the paleontologists that Jurassic Park film modeled Alan Grant, who's the main paleontologist, but he's also a significant real paleontologist. Dr. Curry is very interesting. He started a class called Dino 101, which is a free online dinosaur class, which teaches all the basics and it tells you about the difference between ornithopods and theropods and other dinosaur groups. And it has lots of neat interactive elements, so anyone listening should try to check that out if you can. He's a Canadian paleontologist. He is one of the paleontologists who first hypothesized that large theropods, including tyrannosaurs, hunted in packs and lived in large groups. So without further ado, here's our interview with Dr. Phil Curry. So with us today, we have Dr. Uh, Philip John Curry from the University of Alberta. Dr. Curry has named 25 new dinosaurs and had three named in his honor. He's also famous for a Centrosaurus bone bed, Hadrosaur nesting sites, and the Canada-China Dinosaur Project, and he has written numerous books. He started working at the Royal Alberta Museum in 1976, then the Provincial Museum of Alberta, and found so many dinosaur bones the museum ran out of storage space. In 1979, he wrote the proposal for what is now the Tyrell Museum, which showcases Alberta's dinosaurs and has lab facilities, a study center, and massive storage space. In 2005, he took up the Canada Research Chair at the University of Alberta so he could spend more time in the field. He also teaches the online class Dino 101, which goes over dinosaur appearances in major groups, how fossils are formed and interpreted, how dinosaurs lived, dinosaur origins, dinosaur extinction, and more. So thank you for speaking with me today. You're very welcome. Uh, first, how did you become interested in paleontology? Uh, it's an interesting story because actually I was one of those kids who liked dinosaurs from the time I was six years old. And for me, it was a box of cereal with a plastic dinosaur in it. And uh, that got me hooked. But um, by the time I was 11, I'd read a book called All About Dinosaurs by Roy Chapman Andrews. Andrews' book was really about what it was like to be a paleontologist or a scientist in the field. And the day I read the book was the day I decided I was going to be a dinosaur paleontologist, period, full stop. That's great. And I know you've done field work in Alberta, Antarctica, the Arctic, Argentina, British Columbia, China, Mongolia. Uh, what brings you to those places and what specifically do you look for at those sites? Um, usually it's an invitation that will take me to a different place. Uh, but uh, in some cases, of course, we want to work there. So, for example, in Mongolia and China, uh, specifically in the Gobi Desert of both countries. Uh, the rocks are about the same age as the rocks here in Alberta, and the dinosaurs are very closely related to the ones in Alberta. The difference is that the dinosaurs are preserved in a slightly different way. So even though we're looking at the same dinosaurs, basically, uh, they're preserved differently, and so they give different information. So for me to get information about Alberta dinosaurs, I had to go work in the uh, Gobi Desert, essentially, to understand what was going on there so I could better understand what was going on here. And uh, it's been a very successful program that way. So what are some of the differences in how it's preserved? Well, for example, um, in Alberta, there's a tendency for the large animals to be very well preserved. But the small animals tend to be very spotty, we'll say. And the reason is, of course, you have tyrannosaurs running around and tyrannosaurs, if they found anything at all, uh, living or dead, they would eat it. And if you happen to be small, uh, there wasn't much left. Uh, secondly, I think that um, the environment was such that the rivers were quite strong. And uh, they would uh, cut into the riverbanks and undercut skeletons and rework the bones and so on. And if you happen to be a big animal and the bones are heavy, they'll just fall to the bottom of the stream and then get buried there. They'll stay more or less in association. But the uh, small ones, they just they get busted up pretty badly by the river and washed downstream. So it's not that the bones aren't there, it's just that the skeletons aren't there. So uh, that's, that's kind of a normal preservation here in Alberta. Small dinosaurs are very rare. Hmm. And in the case of Mongolia, it's almost the opposite. Uh, what happens is that uh, the uh, environment was slightly different. It was a semi-arid to arid environment. Uh, very often the small specimens got buried in sand dunes rather than in rivers. And as a consequence of that, these skeletons tend to stay together. 
So if we wanted to look at um, uh, the, say, the anatomy of a dromaeosaur here in Alberta, dromaeosaurs include Velociraptor. Um, we've never found a complete one in Alberta before. Uh, but if you go to Mongolia, then of course you can see a complete specimen of Velociraptor. Then you can understand what all the skeletal bones look like, and then you can come back to Alberta and uh, then uh, identify all those isolated bones that we have, which are very hard to identify otherwise if you've never seen them before. Interesting. Is Mongolia kind of the best place to go for you in terms of excavation, or is it your favorite? For, after Alberta, I mean, Alberta is my favorite because it's in right. my backyard. Go outside and I can collect dinosaurs actually less than 10 kilometers from here. And theoretically, I should be able to find them about 100 meters from here. But uh, the reality is that um, when we compare to other areas, Mongolia uh, has a different kind of preservation, as I mentioned, but uh, you get a lot of big skeletons preserved too. And uh, the thing is, you can almost go out every day in Mongolia and find a new dinosaur skeleton. Uh, here it takes a little bit more time to do that. We have more bones overall, but uh, skeletons, they have more, more skeletons. So it's good balance. So I read uh, Dino Gang's book, and it, uh, well, just really quick, it mentioned your, your wife, Eva, is a paleo, paleobotanist and a paleonologist. Is right. that, so you work very closely together. Does she go on all uh, the digs with you and everything? Yeah, Eva gets to come on all the digs with me, which is which is fantastic. Um, it's certainly good to have a different perspective when you're looking at fossil resources, because you know, I mean, the reality is you're interested in all fossils. Even though I may specialize in theropod dinosaurs, I, I do work on anything that I find, essentially, because it's all interesting and it's all useful for somebody in terms of trying to figure out the um, maybe the depositional environments or the ecosystem or whatever. And uh, in, in her case, because she works on fossil plants and pollen and spores, pollen and spores are very good actually for identifying the level that these bones come from, in other words, what age they are. And uh, consequently, she has a different perspective and that helps. The other good thing for me though is, is that it doesn't take her very long to collect her specimens and then she has to help me. <laughs> <laughs> Your area of expertise includes uh, theropods, origin of birds, uh, dinosaur migration patterns, and herding behavior. What led you to focus on these things? Um, well, I'm very interested in sort of the biology of dinosaurs in general. And uh, for the uh, theropod dinosaurs, it's kind of a natural, you know, the plastic dinosaur I really wanted when I was a kid was Tyrannosaurus rex. And uh, we get Tyrannosaurus rex here, so it's something I can go and find, but also the relatives of Tyrannosaurus rex. The origin of birds came in kind of sideways because um, I never thought I could ever say anything about the origin of birds initially simply because um, the beds in Alberta are Cretaceous in age. They're probably 30 or 40 million years after birds first appeared. So they're too late in time really one would think to tell you much about the origin of birds. But in fact uh, they ended up taking a very interesting twist because some of the small meat-eating dinosaurs here, things like Troodon and Dromaeosaurus, um, these are very bird-like in a lot of ways, and uh, uh, when I was educated uh, at university, the main ideas were that uh, birds probably did not come from dinosaurs. Birds probably came from crocodiles or uh, pecodons or maybe some other group. But uh, the more I looked at these meat-eating dinosaurs from the late Cretaceous, the more I realized how bird-like they were. Uh, including to very, very small details, uh, such as the placement of nerves and holes in the skull, that uh, you wouldn't expect unless there was some kind of relationship. Also, because of our work in China, we had contacts there, and I ended up being invited to work on several of the species of feathered dinosaurs in China. And this has come around full circle now because we're finding feathered dinosaurs here in Alberta. Even though they're late Cretaceous in age, they're, they're theropod dinosaurs and they are very bird-like. And there's a lot we can learn about, say, the structure and evolution of feathers by looking at our late Cretaceous feathers as well. And I also read you worked with computer models to learn more about dinosaurs. And I, I know it's, uh, I took the class Dino 101 and I saw it had a few interactive elements, which is really cool. Do they help to shed light on dinosaur behavior? Well, computer modeling is, is the kind of thing that you, you don't expect dinosaur people to do, right? <laughs> but 
uh, the, the beauty of it is is that uh, dinosaur bones very often are, are very heavy, they're massive, they're fragile, uh, they're very hard to handle in your hands, so you can't manipulate things all that easy. I mean, it's not like we don't have ways to do it. If we do, we can cast them and turn them into like plastic and then play with them that way, but it's a lot easier just to scan uh, specimens or uh, CT scan specimens and then uh, digitize them on a computer and then enable, be able to manipulate the bones. And very often it doesn't tell you exactly what the dinosaur was doing with its, say, leg bones, but what it does give you is a range of possibilities. So it shows how far they can stretch their legs, for example, or how far they can fold their legs up, and then it'll give you some information. And then you work on the uh, premise that somewhere in between is probably the reality. And uh, once you do enough of this kind of work, things start to fall together and start to constrain each other, each one of these models that we do. And consequently, you do end up with, I think, a pretty realistic idea of what the animals were capable of. Certainly, it's uh, uh, a good way to do, say, limb models or biomechanics, where we're looking at, say, how the jaws closed and how they uh, chewed things. But uh, the CT scans and the computer modeling also help us uh, with internal anatomy. So, for example, the brain case of a dinosaur, we can CT scan a skull that doesn't show the brain, brain cavity itself, but uh, from the CT scans we can then get the information on the brain cavity and then we can see where the nerves were running and that helps us uh, uh, interpret uh, how the animal was living, uh, how they were interacting, what they were capable of and all those things. So um, it's, it's pretty amazing what computer modeling has done for paleontology over the uh, uh, last 20 years in particular and uh, as I said it's very often can't get a definite answer, but we can uh, approach much closer to reality by, by doing the modeling. Mm -hmm. So do you use this technique a lot now? Well, I'm, I'm still an old-style paleontologist where I prefer to go in the field and collect things, <laughs> <laughs> do the preparation and do the description. And I do some computer modeling and I work with computer models, but uh, it's something that we've made sure that our students understand better because it's becoming progressively more important for them to be able to do that. You know, at uh, this stage, I would say there are quite a few dinosaurs that uh, we have uh, the digitized information on skeletons for. And, uh, of course, we can make that information available to other researchers anywhere in the world. But uh, we still don't have everything available. And as time goes on and more and more, these digitized skeletons become available to people to work with. And, of course, it's going to become progressively more important for their work. So, so we make sure our students understand this stuff very well and they do a lot of computer modeling, as well as, of course, we still drag them into the field and make them find specimens and collect them and uh, do the basic research on them and because that's also very important to us. So I just wanted to bring up Dino 101 a little bit. and It's a free course open to anyone who wants to join, no prerequisites, and after reading uh, the book Dino Gangs, I got the sense that you're you're very open and inviting uh, with your work. So what made you decide to create this course? Well, uh, I can't take credit for it because it was uh, the Dean of Science at the University of Alberta who first brought it to our attention that we could do this kind of thing. And Of course, my first question was, well, what's a MOOC? I asked him, well, an open course, and uh, I had no idea. It always seemed to me that, that uh, this was an important way that uh, the science was going because so many people are interested in dinosaurs and I get contacted all the time by, by emails or letters or, or people phoning or showing up at my office or whatever. So there's no question that uh, the, uh, the appetite is out there. And uh, it seemed to me that uh, uh, this was a new area for teaching. And um, what we wanted to do was make sure that it was also something we could incorporate in university system. So uh, out of Dino 101, we also have two courses at the university, one which is called Paleo 200 and the other one which is called Paleo 201. And 200 is just the Dino 101 course essentially, except people pay tuitions and they take exams and uh, um, they get graded on it. And 201 goes beyond that where we have field trips, uh, special lectures and so on, so it's, it supplements the basic course itself. What we wanted to do, of course, is uh, in the university see if, in fact, we could turn this course into a basic introductory course so that uh, people could move on from the introductory course into other courses in paleontology. 
And uh, I wasn't sure how that was going to work. And I wasn't sure how it was going to work uh, to the general public as Dino 101 either. It's just one of those things that you, you take a chance on and you believe in that, uh, you know, there's tremendous potential to it, but whether or not you'll ever realize that potential is another matter. Uh, I would have to say it, it's succeeded on all levels that, uh, you know, we've had close to 50,000 students now with Dino 101. It has the best record for uh, people completing the course because a lot of people, of course, they, they sample MOOC courses, but they don't actually complete them. And uh, uh, also, there, there are a lot of statistics that are quite interesting. Uh, you know, people tend to think that it's little boys who like dinosaurs, but the reality is that uh, we've had, in fact, had more girls than boys take the course. So it's, it's, it's quite interesting that way, too. It, uh, it really was something that we thought uh, probably would work, but we had no idea how it was going to work. And um, it's, it's been a great education for me to see that um, even though the course was really aimed at being for a, a first-year university student or, or higher-level uh, high school students, in reality, we've had people as, as young as six years old go through the course. And, uh, you know, with the help of their parents for some of the things, they managed to do very well. <laughs> and so it takes the, uh, the lid off what you think you can do. And, uh, our oldest student, I think, was uh, well into her 80s. So um, it's uh, reached a lot of people and uh, taught us a lot about education as well. Oh, yeah, it's a big range. How often does the course run? Uh, we run the course uh, twice a year right now. So it'll start in September, and then it'll start again in uh, January uh, most years. And that's been the pattern so far. Uh, we may up it three times a year. We're not really sure yet. Uh, we're, in fact, in the uh, process of developing uh, another level of the course, per se, which we're tentatively calling Dino 102. <laughs> and uh, that'll be more specialized uh, than Dino 101. Uh, so, for example, I'll spend a lot of time I'm talking about uh, the origin of birds from theropod dinosaurs. So we'll see how that goes, too. <laughs> yeah, well, I'll tell you now, I'll take that class. <laughs> Good. So there's a lot of interactive elements in Dino 101. We've got you know, videos, lessons, images, but there's, um, let's see, the 3D fossil exploring environment where you range bones online and the interactive timeline that talks about the different ages on Earth. How did you and your team come up with these elements? Well, we have a lot of creative thinkers <laughs> at the university, needless to say, including our, our own graduate students who work in paleontology. Um, everybody's got different experiences and different ways of approaching things. And so fundamentally, this has been a team effort where we, we sit down and we brainstorm and come up with ideas. And some of the ideas don't work as well as we'd like them to, and we replace them with other ideas and, uh, and so on. But, um, you know, the, uh, the interactive museum idea in particular I really like because um, it's something we're doing anyway. I mean, we're, we're taking these bones and we are, as I mentioned, digitizing them and we're using them for computer modeling. And so um, one of the real disadvantages, of course, with an online course is that people can't handle the actual bones. They can't go to a laboratory and, and uh, pick them up and look at these fossils. But uh, by doing the uh, digitized models online, then of course it does give people an opportunity to in fact see these things from all sides, even though it's a, a computer model, nevertheless, it's the same kind of thing that we would work on when we we're doing computer modeling. So uh, there's something to be learned from that. Some of these things have really worked very well for us, and uh, other ones, well, we're still looking at new ideas, new ways of doing it. So according to Dino Gangs, you are a dino hunter. What does that mean? <laughs> Dino hunters are people who will go out and hunt fossils, of course, and mm -hmm. in my case, I'm specifically looking for dinosaurs, um, and uh, whether I'm hunting dinosaurs in uh, my home city of Edmonton, or whether I'm, uh, in fact, working in Antarctica or the Arctic, uh, there's a lot of work involved in, in going out and finding dinosaur bones. They don't just suddenly appear in front of you, or um, you can't walk right up to them and and there they are in most cases. In most cases, what you have to do is spend a lot of time walking and hunting. And uh, so, for example, a, a, a normal day in Dinosaur Provincial Park would be for us to get up early in the morning uh, and start walking and walk all 
they look for fossils. We'll find fossils all the time, but in terms of important fossils, things that are really unique, you have to walk a long, long time. So on average, in spite of the fact that Dinosaur Park has produced more than 800 skeletons over the years, when you look at the amount of manpower that's put in finding those 800 skeletons, it works out to about uh, four man weeks for each one. So four man weeks means that you're walking four weeks without finding anything else. <laughs> It's not quite that simple, of course, but it's, it still shows you that there is, in fact, um, a lot of work involved in finding things. We go to other places like the Arctic and the Antarctic, and sometimes we're walking up to 12 or 16 hours a day and don't find a single scrap of bone of anything. Um, and uh, yet, uh, at the end of the expedition, you may have found something that is only a single bone, which in Alberta, frankly, we would probably ignore because it's not that important, but in the Arctic or the Antarctic, um, an identifiable bone that tells you what animals were in fact living in that area and it becomes a very important specimen and you put a lot of effort into finding it or hunting for it. <laughs> right. So in Antarctica and the Arctic, did you set off on those expeditions expecting to find something or do you have like a tip or something? How did you end up there? Uh, the Arctic was no tip. We knew that uh, dinosaur bones have been found uh, in some cases before. These are just isolated bones that were found uh, fortuitously by, say, a geologist or uh, somebody doing biology on polar bears or whatever. Um, so the Arctic, we didn't have any clues other than the fact that we knew the rocks were the right age and that the potential was there for finding dinosaur bones. Um, so uh, that was an interesting story because we went up there first in 1986. And we looked and looked and looked, and we didn't get anything in the end after something like six weeks. And uh, uh, the following year, there was an Inuit boy out there with a geologist, and he found a dinosaur bone. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and of course, once he found it, then uh, we knew, okay, the area he was was maybe a couple hundred kilometers away from where we were, so we went back in 89, went to the place where he found those bones, and that bone, that initial bone, found lots more dinosaur bones then. So, um, you know, you always have to take a chance sometimes with the, these sites. Antarctica was a little bit different, though, because um, in 1990, a geologist was uh, basically measuring section or figuring out the rocks on a mountainside in uh, pretty much the center of Antarctica. And um, he found uh, dinosaur bones at that time. So in 1990, the specimen was found, it was partly excavated, but of course the conditions there are very difficult and it's very expensive to work there. So uh, we were able to go uh, with a party in uh, something like 13 years after the specimen was found initially to try and collect the rest of the skeleton. And um, that was uh, uh, an absolutely amazing experience. We were working 600 kilometers from the South Pole and 4,000 meters uh, above 11,000 feet above sea level, and so it was cold, <laughs> and, uh, but we got uh, another part of the skeleton, about another third of the skeleton, and ouch, and then we finally went back in 2010 and finished the job, finally, and in the process of doing that, uh, we got to look around a little bit, and we found several more dinosaur skeletons in the same area, so uh, it was a matter of getting to the area first, once we were in the area, then we started to get better luck and get better specimens. So it's, it's, it's always this combination of things. Sometimes you're very lucky and uh, maybe somebody from the general public is out and uh, walking their dog, in the case of one site in, in Edmonton here, and uh, just happened to find a dinosaur bone. And that brings it to our attention and we realize that, uh, well, maybe this is a cool site. So we go and check it, sure enough. <laughs> in the book, it sounded like your focus is on carnivores and specifically um, Tarbosaurus, Batar, uh, okay. <laughs> Batar is in fact a uh, dinosaur that's very closely related to Tyrannosaurus rex. Here in Alberta we have another one called Displetosaurus. And uh, the three animals uh, form this little subfamily uh, group that um, each one of them is very closely related to each other. Tarbosaurus is a very interesting one though, because it's found in the Gobi Desert. And where it's found, it's a dominant animal. Um, it's the most common dinosaur we find there. And that doesn't make any sense because when you think about it, you can't have uh, more lions than antelope. <laughs> uh, 
basically they have to eat, and if they have to eat, there has to be enough food for them to eat. So um, normally what happens is the carnivores only make up about 5% of any fauna. And that's true here in, uh, say, Alberta, where most of our tyrannosaurs are pretty rare animals. There's only one of those for every 20 or so uh, plant-eating dinosaurs. But in Mongolia, it's 50-50, and it doesn't really compute. Something else is going on there. So it's a very interesting problem to try and figure out why we get so many tarbosaur skeletons in Mongolia. We're talking maybe uh, between 70 and 100 uh, skeletons now that we know of from Mongolia. Um, and uh, that's the same number that we have of duckbill dinosaurs and horned dinosaurs and uh, armored dinosaurs and so on. All those animals put together only make up the same thing, the same amount as the tarbosaurs. We know it's got something to do with uh, some kind of preservational bias, though. There's something selectively preserving more tarbosaurs than anything else. And we know that because the same beds also produce footprints. And the footprint sites are very different because even though they're interspersed with where we find the skeletons, when we look at the number of footprints, Tarbosaurus is only about 5% of the animals. So the footprints are telling us this is a normal ecosystem. The skeletons are telling us this is not normal. <laughs> and um, we uh, have a few ideas, uh, you know, for example, uh, it's quite possible that uh, Tarbosaurus was a very effective carnivore that just ate just about everything there was to eat uh, of any animal. So it didn't leave much evidence of the plant-eating dinosaurs that it was eating. Uh, we know that uh, Tarbosaurus, like Tyrannosaurus rex, had these massive teeth and bone-crunching jaws that were probably unbelievable in terms of what they could do and process. And we had a very interesting trip many years ago to Komodo National Park in Indonesia and looked at Komodo dragons and how they functioned. And we witnessed, uh, in one case, a large pig, uh, wild boar, about the same size as a Komodo dragon, which was eaten by nine Komodo dragons who completely dismembered it, ate it, everything, absolutely everything, even the hair, uh, completely gone in less than 20 minutes. <laughs> wow. And there was nothing left, nothing but the smell. <laughs> but it was it was uh, um, a great education, too, because I never realized that Komodo dragons could do that kind of thing. And they don't have the kind of teeth that, say, something like Tarbosaurus had. Tarbosaurus had teeth that really were uh, as well adapted as, say, a hyena is today in terms of uh, eating animals. So um, that's certainly one possible possibility for explaining it. Uh, the only thing is, you know, okay, well, why does it happen there, and why doesn't it happen here? Why why isn't Tyrannosaurus rex doing the same thing? <laughs> so, you know, these, these little puzzles are very interesting, and it's, it's fun to develop a theory or a hypothesis and then go out and see if you can find evidence to support it or refute it. And uh, that's, that's a big part of our fun. I mean, basically, paleontologists are detectives. You know, we, we're looking at these crime scenes that uh, are 60 or 100 million years old, and uh, we're trying to figure out what happens. And uh, it, it's a lot of fun. It's, it's, it's great, a great mental process trying to work these things out, as well as working with fascinating animals all by themselves. So I know one of your theories is that dinosaurs may have lived in gangs. Could you elaborate a little bit on that? In, uh, in Alberta here, we have um, these fantastic sites uh, all over the province, in fact, where, you know, we don't find whole skeletons, per se. What we find are what's called bone beds. And in the bone beds, we have uh, the remains of many individuals where all the bones have fallen apart. Essentially, the skeletons have fallen apart, and the bones have become mixed together. So you sometimes can't tell which bones belong to which individuals. However, some of these bone beds are dominated by single species of animals. And I started working on this in the 1970s and realized that almost certainly uh, what I put all my time into at that time was a ceratopsian bone bed where more than 70 ceratopsian or horned dinosaurs have died in the same place at the same time. And the only way uh, in the end to explain this was that these animals were living together at the time of their death, and they were probably living together up 
to the time of their death. And this uh, implied that these animals, in fact, had social structure. We now have a tremendous amount of evidence about these uh, horned dinosaurs traveling in herds. Uh, we have uh, herds in Dinosaur Park now that seem to represent mass death sites of thousands of animals. And in other parts of the world, like Montana, we now know that duck-billed dinosaurs, in fact, also have sites, which strongly suggests these animals were moving in very large herds as well. Uh, Alaska as well has, has evidence of herds uh, here in Edmonton. Uh, Ten kilometers from my house, we have a herd of uh, Edmontosaurus, one of the big duck-billed dinosaurs, and so on and so on. So we know, I think we're pretty sure that uh, the plant-eating dinosaurs uh, by the Lake Cretaceous were, in fact, herding animals and probably migrating animals as well. Now, the thing is that if you look at a modern ecosystem where you have large herds of herbivores, you almost invariably have packs of carnivores as well. And that's because the herbivores are ganging together in part so that they can protect themselves from the carnivores. And that's good for the herbivores. It's not good for the carnivores. The carnivores need to eat. So um, basically, they uh, develop social structures as well. So if you go on the African belt, for example, lions, which are very closely related to tigers, uh, lions have very specific social structures. Uh, and that's because they move in groups or prides or family groups, and they hunt together. And they're going after, of course, herds of antelope, herds of zebra, herds of other things. So there's a strong association between herds and packs, or herds and prides. Um, same thing in North America with uh, herds of caribou and packs of wolves, for example. You always see these kind of things. Now, for a long time in dinosaurs, we knew that uh, we have these enormous herds of duckbill dinosaurs and enormous herds of horned dinosaurs, but we didn't have any evidence for the carnivores doing the same thing. But a curious thing happened in, in that um, when I was doing some museum searching at one point, I found out that in 1910, Barnum Brown, who on his very first expedition to collect dinosaurs in Alberta, found a site where there were all these tyrannosaurs that were living together, or had died together. And he had parts of nine skeletons of uh, the tyrannosaur Albertosaurus from one single place. And uh, that got me pretty excited. So we dug out what evidence we could to, sh to help us refine the site. And uh, there was a photograph, luckily, and that one photograph in the end led to the discovery of the site that Brown had excavated in 1910. Well, Brown had only excavated part of the skeleton, and uh, he, in fact, had left a lot of it in the ground still. Um, so we took the number from nine animals to more than 20 animals in the one bone bed. And this is a place where we have uh, tyrannosaurs, and we have a few duckbill dinosaur bones, but they seem to be almost uh, ancillary. They're, they're, they're just there by accident. They were washed in by the river, and they're not articulated animals. So um, uh, suddenly we had this evidence to suggest that uh, at least some tyrannosaurs move together in packs. And we started looking at other uh, tyrannosaur sites uh, to see if, in fact, there was evidence that other tyrannosaurs were doing the same thing as Albertosaurus. And Tarbosaurus in Mongolia, one of the reasons we may have so many animals there and why they, they outnumber all the plant-eating dinosaurs as well is because maybe these things, in fact, were also moving in packs. And that what we're finding in Mongolia are remnants of these packs that got trapped by some natural process and killed multiple individuals of them. So um, right now I think I feel pretty strongly about the fact that uh, we have packs of uh, meat-eating dinosaurs that in fact are hunting the herds of plant-eating dinosaurs. Is that a, a widely accepted theory? Well, it's, it's very interesting because of course when we first proposed that we had a herd of uh, horned dinosaurs, everybody was very much against that. Everybody assumed that uh, dinosaurs were just typical reptiles and Reptiles today don't usually um, move in any kind of social uh, groupings. So there was a lot of resistance to that initially. But the thing is that uh, we got so much evidence. There were so many uh, 
places in Alberta where we had these herds of horned dinosaurs, or between Montana and Alberta where we had these uh, herds of duckbill dinosaurs. And subsequent to that, of course, we found lots of sites of uh, better footprint sites where we have other types of dinosaurs too, including the giant sauropods moving in groups. So the old evidence eventually became so overwhelming that I think the majority of people accepted it just by the, um, this tidal wave of information that was being collected worldwide. Uh, with carnivores, you're dealing with animals that are much rarer, and consequently, uh, you, you have a much uh, lower chance of finding um, groupings like this. But now we have quite a few sites that are doing the same kind of thing. So I'd say the idea is new enough that uh, there's still quite a bit of resistance to the idea, but I think um, as time goes on, people look into it more and try and prove or disprove it, it doesn't matter which, you do in fact collect evidence that's going to show what reality was, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, right now I would say that the, um, the shift is, is coming towards people accepting more the idea that uh, these animals did move in groups. So I know you, you've collaborated, such as with the Korea-Mongolia International Dinosaur Project. Um, do you find that you learn more from working in teams or more on your own? Which do you prefer? I kind of like both, but uh, the reality is with uh, you know small projects, you can do those by yourself. But when you're, you're dealing with something that uh, potentially has a tremendous amount of information that you get together or where you need different kinds of sciences or different uh, pe or people with different kinds of expertise to work together, then uh, the larger projects work better as teams. Uh, paleontology, like I think all of the science, has become much more multidisciplinary and multinational over the years. And uh, we find that, um, yeah, we still may do individual projects, but in fact that for the majority of the projects that we're working with, if you want to uh, make some true breakthroughs, then it's really good to work together as a group. There's really advantages in that. If you have a wish list of finds, what would be on the top of it? Oh, my wish list would probably be Troodon. <laughs> Troodon's uh, was first found in 1854, if you believe it, a single tooth in Montana. And uh, for a long time, we had no idea what Troodon was. It was a, uh, a small theropod dinosaur. For some people, for other people, it was a lizard. For other people, it was a plant-eating dinosaur. Uh, we really had no idea. But in the 1980s, we, in fact, uh, found a jaw here in Alberta, which proved that Troodon was a carnivorous dinosaur. Uh, it turned out to be another dinosaur that we had called Stenonicosaurus, which was the brainiest dinosaur we knew of. Uh, the largest known brain. Uh, this is an animal with a brain that, uh, for its body size, is about six times the size of a crocodile with the same body size. Um, it's an animal that had binocular vision, like us. It could uh, see things in three dimensions. It had hands that could manipulate things. It had uh, very long legs that were built for speed. It's a runner. Um, and uh, now we know from uh, specimens in Mongolia and China that this is in fact a feathered dinosaur as well and probably the dinosaur that's most closely related to birds. Now the curious thing is that after all these years we still find bits and pieces of this dinosaur but we have never found a whole skeleton and uh, so for me I would just love to find a whole skeleton just to know that all the things we've put together over the years uh, all the evidence in fact uh, is correct. <laughs> My last question is, what advice would you give to budding paleontologists or people who are just enthusiastic about dinosaurs? Well, of course, uh, there's many ways to be enthusiastic about dinosaurs, and there are many people who specialize in dinosaurs in different ways. And, of course, not everybody likes to do research, not everybody likes to do field work, not everybody likes to uh, work in the bestie collections of an old museum. Uh, some people like to do things on computer modeling and everything. There's just so many ways you can work on dinosaurs. And, um, uh, you know, if you want to become a research paleontologist, you really have to go the whole mile. You have to go through your schooling. You have to try and get um, uh, a doctorate eventually. You have to uh, uh, publish research papers. You have to go to writing and illustration and finding things. And, and all the rest of it. I mean, there's there's a lot of things involved. 
But there are also people who are like dinosaurs who only go as far as becoming, say, collections managers. They don't do much research. They, they're more interested in just handling and dealing with fossils themselves or becoming technicians where they're doing preparation on dinosaurs. I love doing preparation, but I never have time to do any preparation <laughs> because I spend most of my time, of course, writing and, and things like that. There's other people who are, in fact, artists who specialize in nothing but dinosaurs. There's three in Alberta alone who are world-famous artists who do nothing but work on dinosaurs. Um, so there are, there's many ways to skin the cat. And it's basically, you have to decide exactly what you want to get into and then find the way to do it, the mechanism to do it. In my case, it was a matter of, even as a high school student, I was going to people who were already paleontologists, asking them what I needed to do in terms of my coursework to get into university and to specialize in dinosaurs eventually. In other cases, of course, if you're an artist and you want to do it that way, then, then you would approach art school and uh, see what you can do that way. But uh, the main thing is don't be afraid to talk to people because uh, everybody in the field, whether you're a research scientist or an artist who specializes in dinosaurs, they're very willing to talk to people and see them develop their uh, preference for a career. The dinosaur of the day is Torbosaurus. So Torbosaurus was kind of the Asian counterpart of Tyrannosaurus rex living in Asia about 70 million years ago in the late Cretaceous, just like T-Rex, except for the Asia part. <laughs> he weighed up to five tons and had about 60 teeth. Tyrannosaurus, by comparison, Tyrannosaurus rex, was about six tons, so just a little bit smaller. But they looked very similar. They both had the very small two-fingered forelimbs and the big three-toed uh, hind legs. Torbosaurus was also very long, 33 to 39 feet, still not quite as long as T-Rex, but very long. The whole Tyrannosaurus family, the Tyrannosaurids, had a few things in common that are very interesting. So when they were a young family, <laughs> before they evolved, they were not the apex predators. They were actually some of the smaller meat eaters, and... Tyrannosaurids or Tyrannosauridae were one of the last groups to become very large in uh, the dinosaur time frame. It took until about the end, the last 20 million years of the dinosaur era to become their full size. And although they became the biggest meat eaters that, or some of the biggest meat eaters that we saw in that era, they all had proportionally large skulls and strong necks compared to other dinosaurs. So most dinosaurs had sharp teeth for cutting through meat, but the Tyrannosaurids had very large, powerful teeth and necks so they could do more ripping. And there's even a theory that Tyrannosaurus rex and maybe Torbosaurus would grab onto the frill of a Triceratops and rip its head off of its body, and then it could get at the neck meat, which is pretty horrifying. <laughs> but it shows just how powerful its neck was. And part of the theory about why its arms are so small is that its skull weighed so much that if it had large arms, it would topple over forward. So evolving smaller arms allowed its head to get bigger, and then it has that big bulky tail also to counterbalance it. So living in the late Cretaceous, Torbosaurus was one of the last dinosaurs, um, at least non-avian dinosaurs, and as we discussed they were large but they were not that heavy, they actually had a pretty lightweight skeleton. One interesting fact is that Torbosaurus was actually uh, more ancient than T-Rex, which suggests that the genus could have initially appeared in Asia and then they entered North America through a land bridge that connected the continents in the Cretaceous period. To go along with the theory of the Torbosaurus hunting in packs, there's an interesting phenomenon that may have existed, which is that the young Torbosaurs and other Tyrannosaurids may have been faster than the adults. So 
they put on a lot of weight in their version of puberty, I guess. <laughs> they became full-grown adults at around 20 years old, but before that, they were pretty lean and very fast. They had a longer shin bone than upper leg bone, which across the animal kingdom is correlated to sprinting ability. So if you have a longer lower leg, you can typically run faster than if you have a longer upper leg. And as the Tyrannosaurids grew up, the shin bone got shorter relative to the upper leg. And along with the additional weight, they may not have been able to move as quickly. And you can tell that through some of the ichnology on the, the tracks, depending on how far apart they are and how they look, you can estimate how fast they could move. So to go along with the hunting in packs, it's possible that the young, faster Tyrannosaurids or Torbosauruses in this case, would chase a, another dinosaur into either get tired or towards the larger uh, members of the group, and then with their big powerful jaws and strong neck muscles, they could take down whatever the younger ones were chasing. So I know I've seen documentaries where they show lions doing this. You'll see the, the female lions chasing them around and at the end of the hunt, they chase them into a ambush, and they all pounce. So it could have been a similar behavior going on with the Tyrannosaurs on a much larger scale. Now the fun fact of the day, most dinosaurs were vegetarians, but the first dinosaurs were carnivores, according to the book Inside Dinosaurs. So now through May 7th, you can actually take the Dino 101 also known as Dinosaur Paleobiology course put on by Dr. Curry at the University of Alberta. And to sign up for that course, you just go to www.coursera.org and Coursera is C-O-U-R-S-E-R-A, like a course with a ceratops. <laughs> Except I'm sure that's not the purpose. And it's a really good class, highly recommended, and it's free. So there's really no reason not to take it. And as always, if you'd like to learn more about dinosaurs or find a dinosaur location near you, you can go to our website, which is iknowdino.com, and find out more information there.